Hello everyone um, and welcome to the BFI um, Film Academy August Lab. My name is Alex and I'm the festival and events producer with the Film Academy. I'm really excited about today's session. We'll be exploring the role of a scripted format producer. So we'll discuss the different types of producers that exist in the um, film and TV industry um, today and also their responsibilities. And we'll also talk about the skills and experience that are needed to break into um, scripted production. Uh, the panel today will be hosted by Rowan Woods. Um, Rowan is an independent editorial consultant, uh, programmer and moderator. She works for the British Council and there she advises international film festivals on UK film projects. And she's also a programmer at the BFI um, London Film Festival. Um, she previously worked on many of the BBC's key film programs and was also a development executive at BBC Films. So uh, we are really excited to have Rowan uh, with us here today. Um, but just before I introduce you um, to Rowan, um, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping things. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that we have our uh, BFI Film Academy team working behind the scenes. Um, Noel will be managing the chat box. Um, so feel free to say hi, introduce yourselves to Noel, and if you have any um, generic questions about the BFI, about the Film Academy, or our labs program, then please do ask Noel um, in the chat box. Um, I also wanted to let you know that our, um, the submissions for the Future Film Festival are closing this Friday, so you have only six days left to submit your short films um, to our festival. Um, so if you have any questions um, about the festival um, before submitting, Noel is your guy, feel free um, to ask him. Um, Laura will be uh, managing your questions for the panelists today. So if you have any questions for Rowan or any of our panelists, then please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. And we will devote the last 15 minutes um, of the session uh, for um, your question your questions. Um, we've actually taken your feedback on board um, that you've uh, submitted through the last um, couple of surveys after our labs and um, we know that you've said that you wanted to see this session last a little bit longer. So this time um, the panel discussion will be 60 minutes long and then it will be follow followed by a 15 minute um, Q&A um, session. Um, I also have to mention our partners. Um, Ruben Foundation sponsor all uh, BFI education events and also Lacey are our competition partner and they'll be giving away a hard drive at the end of this session. So um, to um, all of you who've um, um, entered to um, um, be in this competition when you were first registering for this event, please make sure that you um, stick around until the very end of the event um, when we'll be announcing the winner and we'll be announcing the winner live. Um, so if you're not around when we call your name, then we'll just move on to the next name. So just make sure that you stay, uh, you stick around until after the panel discussion. Um, and also, just like last time, we'll be awarding the best question uh, asked of our panelists. So get your thinking cat hats on and make sure that you put your full name when you are asking um, the questions in the Q&A box so that we know who you are. Um, what else? Uh, oh yes, I wanted to let you know um, that we've um, also taken your feedback on board about networking. So you've told us that one aspect of our in-venue events that you've really enjoyed um, is uh, being able to network with each other and find collaborators for your project. Um, so we've started a Facebook group after our last lab for you to do just that. And um, Noel will shortly post the link um, to that Facebook group in the chat box. So feel free um, to join and share your contacts, your portfolios, and your profiles with each other um, and get chatting. Um, and as the very final thing, I wanted to let you know that the session today will be recorded um, and they will be sharing the recording across the BFI Film Academy social channels um, next week. Um, and, and now it's over to Rowan to introduce you to our lovely panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Um, I hope you're all well wherever you are. Um, as Alex said, um, I'm Rowan Woods. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, today, we're going to be digging into the role of the producer, um, exploring what it involves, the different kinds of producers, what makes a good one, and how you get to be one. I'm really pleased to be joined by a really great selection of panellists with a broad range of experience um, who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. Um, so we have Lauren Dark, um, who is a senior commissioning executive at Film4, and has produced the features Beast by Michael Pierce and War Book by Tom Harper. 
Emma Duffy is head of development at BBC Films and recently produced Georgia Paris's debut feature, Mari. She was previously a development executive at the BFI and drama and film executive at the Wellcome Trust. Yor Basoa is a producer whose debut feature, Zero, directed by Faye Gilbert, is currently in post-production. And Di Barton is a production executive at Sister Pictures and a line producer for television whose credits include Sherlock, 13, Doctor Who, as well as long-running shows like EastEnders. So thanks so much, guys, for taking the time to join us on a Saturday. Um, I think your and Emma, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've both recently produced your first features as, as producer. Um, when you meet someone, say you're at a wedding and you meet someone and as, make it, as part of small talk, they ask you what you do. How do you briefly and succinctly explain to them what the job of a producer is? Emma, let's start with you. A hard one. I get asked that like by my mum and dad, so I don't think you even need to <coughs> imagine something that's in a sort of uh, small talk capacity at a wedding. Um, I think the simplest answer is you say that you you make films and you are the one who is responsible for ensuring that it gets made and gets made in the way that is the right way to make the film. And I think the other the other thing that is helpful to sort of explain is that you're probably the person who is on board the longest so you are there from the beginning usually but not not always through the script writing process through raising the finance to ensure that you have the resources to make the film <clears throat> through production to make sure you find the right people to make the film and then actually making it <laughs> which is crucial but actually only takes up this sort of small slice in the middle and then finding the right partners to get it out to audiences whether that is theatrical distribution or online or you know whatever is best for your your film um and i think that that surprises some people that it is across all of those all of those parts so if they've listened to me for that long that's what i'll say <laughs> <laughs> and i guess it's I guess also just to add to that, it's it keeps going because your film has a life and it becomes part of someone's library and you have to keep monitoring um, payments coming back from that. You've got lots of different partners and as the producer, there's, you might outsource a lot of that to other people, but ultimately you you remain responsible for this baby of a film pretty much from conception till the end. Um, so yeah, there's just a bit more. Than, yeah. than that, yeah. I thought what might be helpful is because it'll still be so fresh in, in both of your minds um, that maybe we'll look at both um, Mari and Zero, which you guys have just produced, and perhaps sort of dig into sort of the, the process that you went through on, on, on both of those features. So maybe your, if we start with you and perhaps you can talk us through sort of right from the start, maybe getting, you know, getting the project up to production, the process that you went through, and then Emma will come to you and perhaps you can talk us through sort of from production through through sort of um, festivals and distribution. So your, how did, how did Zero start? Um, so I think a bit like a lot of other people's films, myself and Faye, the writer-director, had a previous relationship. We had both been on Guiding Lights, um, which is a mentoring scheme that Lighthouse in Brighton run. Um, and we worked out that we wanted to collaborate on projects going forward. So we made, we developed a docudrama together and then we made a short film, a BFI short called The Line. Um, and on that, whilst we're doing that, we then started thinking about ideas for our first feature. Um, and when uh, Zero, oh, sorry, The Line played in Palm Springs, the Palm Springs Festival. And whilst we're there, Faye had a germ of an idea. Um, which was a kind of revenge thriller. It was a Western. And we really wanted to make a response to the geopolitical climate at the time. So there was a, just a lot of patriarchal regimes. There was uh, Boko Haram and ISIS. It was just at the beginning of the migrants crisis. So we really wanted to take those themes and turn that into a story. So that sort of revenge Western evolved into more of a dystopian chase thriller. And we batted that between us for a while until the point where we thought, okay, so how are we gonna finance this? How, who are we gonna really develop with, this with? And 
on the one hand, we thought we could take it to the BFI and do it as a bigger BFI project, or we could look at the, the one of the two schemes that were operating at the time, iFeatures or Microwave, where you have that development element, but you do also get to make your film and you make it with really good partners. So we thought, okay, let's put it into Microwave. And we were fortunate enough to be selected for that and then um, to be one of the two that were progressed. So we then developed it for a while. Um, and then when it got into a shape that we were comfortable with and our partners were comfortable with, in fact, Rowan, when you're at the BBC, you're one of the people that read it and gave us some really good notes. So that was really cool. And so when we got to the point um, where it was ready to go into production, then it wasn't a foregone conclusion with Microwave. You don't just go and make it the next day. You still have to go back to the partners, mm. the BFI, BBC Films, and Film London, and they have to be confident that you're ready to, to make it into the film. So we got to that stage. Um, we had to, they gave us two thirds of the finance, so I had to go and raise another third. So I went to a private investor who was interested in film, and, and he invested um, a third in. And then, yeah, so we're ready to shoot it. So that got through to the production part of it. And so we were very keen with Zero, as I am with all my productions, that the crew are, and, and the cast and just the whole ecosystem is quite representative. So we we're keen that we're, there were at least 50% female HODs, there were people of colour across, um, in front of the camera and behind the camera. And so, we were really uncompromising in who we worked with, despite the budget. Um, and that was very much the case for our HODs. It's tougher um, with the whole crew because it's such a small amount of money that we're play we were playing with, with Zero. Um, so we, um, we, maxed, uh, we um, yeah, matched a few more experienced people with a lot more um, trainees. We used a uh, uh, trainee finder to be able to find some people and yeah so we we got this team together and we actually shot zero outside of london we went to suffolk and we so we shot in ipswich we shot in um this interesting studio space outside of ipswich and then we also shot in a natural um, a national trust place called orford ness um and it was a really challenging shoot. We did everything in 18 days. Um, we had teenagers and children in every single shot. Um, Lauren was at the BFI at the time and Lauren um, came, she did a visit um, at one stage and she came for the day where we had like four babies in on the shot and um, yeah, on screen. It was just a crazy lot of stuff to do, but I think really, fulfilling in the end and I learned so much from that process so yeah so, so I think we can we can see from, from that that even before you get to the point where you're actually shooting the project how much work there is to there is to do in terms of the script development raising the finance um nego you know navigating sort of the, the various different financiers overseeing casting crewing um Emma once you then get to production and then sort of into into post-production what does the producer's job in involve I think there's the, the basic job which is ensuring that that process happens in the right way so you are you will have contracted an editor before you start shooting but negotiating <clears throat> with their agent over particularly we made mari through the same scheme that zero is made through um, so a lot of negotiating over hours and rates and and where the work is, is being done, for example. Oh, we're slight, um, we're slight, I think I'm slightly losing you um, uh, in terms of audio. Are you able to sort of slightly lean slightly yes. close to the microwave? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. I want you to close my windows. I think there's some building work going on outside, but we'll persevere for now. Um, so a lot of negotiating around that um, and... But all, and we had a really great post partner in Technicolor, so they did all of our sound, all of our picture, grade, etc., and all of our deliverables. They were fantastic. Um, but I think a really crucial part of that, and I think this is something that you don't always see, is 
being a sort of repository for what the intentions were when you were writing the very initial outline or when you got to the final draft or when you were on set with the actors and you know what the director's intentions were and what the vision was because I think in the edit things get you know you're in there every single day the editor and the director um, and then different producers will handle this differently I probably came in at least once a week um, because I think it's important to have some distance slightly crazy look in their eyes and we've cracked something and they want to show it to you but you can't you can't be that pair of eyes if you've been sat there figuring it out with them. Um, so it's really your the role of the producer is really crucial there to understand what it is as a shared endeavour that you're wanting to accomplish but being able to have some distance to sort of to judge on that and see how they can make that work. Um, and the, the same goes for acting blocked the edit as well but um i really enjoyed that part actually because in some ways things did feel more controlled compared to prep which is very intense production where things go smoothly some things don't but you're having to be quite reactive um because you've only got a certain amount of time and resources and then in post things can be a little bit more fluid which has its positives and negatives um, um, Emma, um, Emma, you, you, you keep dropping in and out. So what I might do is just yeah. move on to a couple of other questions, and, yeah. and perhaps, perhaps you, you maybe you maybe you can sort of leave and, and rejoin, see yes. if you can figure out the figure out the sound. Um, so, um, Lauren, I'm going to come on to um, come on to you now. You've previously worked um, as a producer and you know done a very um, similar job to, uh, to, to to your and Emma, um, but you now work as a uh, an executive producer at Film Four. Um, how how does the role of an executive producer differ from the role of a producer? Um, it's quite different. I think my um, that set visit for Zero was my first week. Like I, like I basically made Beast and then I had a baby. So I was on my maternity leave and I came off of that maternity leave to cover um, Kristen Irving's uh, maternity leave at the BFI. And I think my first week was a set visit. And I just was like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm just getting in the way and like stepping on cables. And like everyone there on set has a job when you're in the thick of like shooting the film. So I think it, yeah, it took a while to kind of feel comfortable with the switch over. But basically we work on, um, when I was a producer, um, I was, my main kind of partner was a, another producer called Ivana McKinnon. And we had a slate. Um, so after I'd left the production company, 16 Films, Ivana and I had a slate of about five, six, seven projects that we'd work on together. And I'd also kind of look for material. And so it's quite intense working on those projects that you're trying to kind of bring to life. And I think when you go into commissioning and kind of execing, the slate we work on is, is much, much, much bigger. So it's much more hands off. It's kind of like you're kind of coming in um, to the, that filmmaking team's lives. Like maybe it's going to be every draft in the development process. Maybe it's a little bit more bespoke kind of to what's needed. So sometimes we feed in, like once the kind of um, idea has been commissioned, we'd feed in probably at every scripting step. So whether that's a treatment or an outline and then a, a draft or sometimes people will send pages and we'd sit together um, and have a script meet or we'd give written notes. Um, and then we try to help the filmmakers kind of push that film into production when, when we kind of all feel the script is ready. Um, and so that process is sort of like, it's sort of in collaboration with, but it's much less intense than kind of you know actually producing the film and being um you know right at the center of the whole of the whole thing and what's the relationship between the title of executive producer and the money and fi and financing yes i think i think sometimes it, it's it's very often a credit that gets attached to a financial contribution so you tend to get like you could get some films with like 15 exec producers and you can't really tell like who did what and who represents which but I think if you have, you know, even on a kind of debut film, you might have um, maybe BFI, BBC or Film 4 um, or another kind of couple of financiers or, a, um, you know, regional fund. And, and every one of those bodies will have a kind of commissioner or a, 
like an exec that, that will be um, either the one that commissioned the project or kind of brought it onto the slate um, or the person who's going to be with that team for the for that film's life and so that that would usually be the, the exec producer. And to what extent do you see your role as um, as quite a, a sort of nurturing and, and supportive one? I mean obviously you you are not getting your hands dirty as such, you're not making the film, but do you, do you think of yourself as being there to sort of support and nurture and, and sort of encourage and, you know, be someone that can, that can uh, answer questions if the team have, ha have difficulty or is that relationship different depending on each of the films? No, completely. That's completely what it is. And I think it's about, you know, you're trying to help a team bring to life a vision, like a filmmaker's vision. And so, trying to use I guess a kind of working knowledge of of an industry given that we work across so many projects and um, lend kind of that knowledge of when people are trying to crew or, or cast or um, uh, assemble the kind of financiers so kind of all of that is very and actually in my first kind of couple of years there I found it really useful to have just produced a debut because I felt like and, and, and still feel like I remember all of those challenges and they seem to be quite similar like as you go through all of these cycles with filmmakers on their first um on their first film particularly like i remember exactly what it feels like to try to um let go of the film in the edit or like exactly as emma says do work have a period of time where you're working out what you have versus what you intended to have and 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 how um you know a kind of cast piece of casting falling through and having to reimagine. I remember all of that kind of quite well. So I think that's been really useful in terms of exactly nurturing people through the first the first time and, and after that as well. And can as I a, just can oh. I just add to that slightly um, that quite a few producers, especially at the beginning, see the execs as someone to potentially be feared or to hide things from and things like that. And I just think as producers, you, you should really uh, see them as a, a really important collaborator. As Lauren was saying just then, they, they quite often they've been producers themselves or they've been across lots of different projects and they just, they can be there to really help you problem solve. When you're making a film, so many things go wrong. And as a producer, it's you that has to problem solve constantly and your execs can be people that you can really lean on at times in certain situations to try and resolve things. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. And, and, and Lauren, as, um, as an exec at, at a, a, you know, one of the UK's sort of um, largest financiers, um, you will work with lots of different projects, lots of different producers. Do you notice um, that uh, different producers do things in different ways? Does, is there one uniform job or does, you know, a produ certain producer have a very different style to, to another producer that you might be working with? Yeah, completely. I think that's one of the most... Uh, to me encouraging things about the question we're asking of how do you become a producer because I think there is no one way there are so many different kinds of producers and there are some that are excellent at putting together finance and have an amazing set of relationships and and some that are in, in, like excellent on script and kind of creative producing and others that have just come through um, physical production and some people that have done all of those things so everyone works in slightly different ways and sometimes people put or they put things they put kind of um, teammates around themselves or they partner up with other producers based on, you know, skills that complement their own or, or that, um, that fill a gap. So I think there's no one way to do it. And I think that, you know, for me, I, I sort of tried to do a bit of everything, a bit of production, a bit of script editing and just kind of found what I, what felt most natural after, you know, like 10 years, I think. And um, Lauren, you mentioned um, that you were working in partnership with um, with Ivana, um, and you know, on Beast there was there was three different producers. Um, how, how common is that that there are multiple producers on on a project, and and why really and why common. is that? Mm, really common, I think. I think for partly for for some of the reasons I just mentioned, as in by which I mean, you might have a producer who has a fantastic relationship with with the director or writer and they've developed a project and they're really passionate about the kind of creative development but need a hand kind of getting that film up off the ground and financed or, or perhaps they've never 
been in in production properly before on their own and so you would put maybe we as execs kind of sometimes we we help people partner up or um or team up um other times so in the in the example you mentioned of beast beast was a project that originated in a company called agile who were um at the time when we were developing beast a commercials company so this was going to be their first um feature or their first kind of drama and so they wanted and christian brady who was one of those three producers had developed that film up to a draft and they wanted to partner up with producers who had kind of been in production before or, or worked with the kind of the funders and that kind of thing so we met with them i think about two years before we actually shot it and we met as kind of like the drafts ready and they want to shoot and of course it just takes always longer than you think it's going to so we kind of developed the all together for about another year and then bfi were already on board i think film four took about six months to join the project and then there was about another you know six months of casting so um and ivana and i were kind of one we were one company at that point so then three of us ended up being the producers on the film Great, thank you. Um, now we're going to come back in a minute and really dig down into what a typical day looks like for each of you. Um, but first, um, Di, I'd love to bring you in here um, uh, with a with a slightly different perspective. You know, you you work in television, but you're also a line producer, which is quite um, a distinctively different role from from the producer. Could you perhaps explain to us how a line producer differs from a producer? Yes. Well. Um... Ultimately, the line producer is responsible for the crew and the contracts. Um, initially, uh, the line producer writes the budget. So we come on quite early and then uh, usually without a script in television, um, but with an outline. So you collaborate with the producer about the level of, of talent they're looking at and so on and then um and when you say level of talent you mean sort of really famous a-list talent or whether it's slightly more emerging talent and, and yes and because they yes. will cost cost a different amount to cast exactly yes um and so then so i work with the producer to get the um the budget ready for green light from the broadcaster and then i basically recruit the um the crew uh so the director is chosen by executive producers and producers and they uh they will have heads of department that they would like to use but i negotiate all of those deals um now a you know a drama unit high-end drama unit is usually about i don't know 60 70 people so i negotiate all those deals and bring all those people on board and i um I negotiate with all the facilities, the studios, just all the nuts and bolts, basically. Um, and then I, uh, I have to manage all these people and <laughs> hopefully, and really the other th thing to do is to, is to manage the expectation and the ambition of the project within the, the budget that you have, which is always the tricky bit. Um, you can really only do that if your relationship with your producer works and and also the relationship with the director um line producers are often known as dream killers by directors um which is something uh i try not to do i the way i like to work is i i'd like to build a relationship with the director so that we can have conversations without him feeling that i'm him or her feeling that i'm out there to kill their dream and and how hands-on are you when it when it comes when you're actually um uh, when the project is in production um so I, th I think it was emma earlier said you know maybe as a producer you might not be on set every day are you are you, are you on set um i personally am generally on set at some point every day um i obviously have quite a lot of um administrative work to to do so what i tend to do is i tend to rock up at breakfast handily um but that's the best time to be able to talk to people i talk to the director and the first ad and and get their take on how they feel the day is looking and whether they have concerns and then i um 
and then I go back to the office once they they appear to be up and running um, and I also chat with the rest of the crew as well because you can pick up the vibe and if there are problems or if somebody's upset or unhappy or uh, and hopefully catch it before it becomes a big issue uh, and then I would go back to the office and then I go back for about half an hour before the end of the day to wrap up the day if they feel if the first AD feels they're not going to achieve the day on time uh, there's a conversation to be had about whether they can continue it uh, tomorrow or whether we need to go into overtime there's all of that to happen and um, and then if we need to go into overtime I need to talk to all of the crew and um, and get them on board to to go over into overtime. So is it fair to say that if if the producer is the one who is um, you know ra raising the overall budget of the film you are the one that is then in a really sort of getting into the nitty-gritty of how that budget is allocated and how yes. it is spent? Yeah and so then all all of the HODs, I would give the HODs um, their budget, what their budget is, and they then report back to me with the production accountant, who is my very close ally. Um, we would have weekly meetings with the HODs to see how their budget's going. Obviously, the accounts department have information that's come through purchase orders and so on. So we can see, and if they're running into trouble, then I would generally talk to the producer and say the art department are they have a real problem is there something we can do with the set or can we do this in a different location or so it's um yeah i suppose in very basic terms i always say that producer does the art and i do the money um it's not quite as bold as that but it's um uh, and, and at what point does your job end do you, do you finish when once production finishes? Yes, usually I um, when we get to the end of the shoot, I'm usually on board for maybe three weeks or a month closing down the shoot because I then hand on to a post production supervisor. So they the post production supervisor will have been involved sooner because um, if you're shooting on a series, then you're shooting multiple episodes we shoot in blocks so you might have shot episode one and two and now you're doing five and six and <coughs> four because we never shoot them in the right order um so the post-production supervisor is already looking after the post-production because we don't wait till we've shot everything we have to do it as we go because we we're usually quite um hard up against um a delivery date so i would then hand on to them and uh, go and have a lie down. <laughs> <laughs> a well-deserved one. And so, um, so you work in, in, in television and, uh, and you're Lauren and, uh, and Emma um, uh, work, work in film. Um, how different is the role of a producer between film and television? And, and, and do you have to specialise? Is it possible to work across both? I think as a line producer, it is possible. Um, it, it's, it's surprisingly, it's, it's harder to move from TV into film, but I think that's just a perception thing. Um, I think they are slightly different skills. The nuts and bolts are the same, but I think they are slightly different skills because, um, and I have to say I've never worked in film, so correct me if I've got this wrong, ladies and gentlemen, um, that you have because of the, the way that a film is financed, you have a more or less locked script before you start. We are on a constant, the scripts keep evolving. So you, they keep getting rewritten and you're getting rewrites even when you're shooting them. And I think that's, that's one side of it that's very difficult. I, I worked with um, a line producer recently who'd really only done film and was absolutely horrified at the way uh, TV works because you know the scripts weren't ready and and they kept changing um, and I think that's the biggest difference and the fact that we shoot in on series we shoot in in blocks so we're constantly shooting one prepping another probably post-production another one 
whereas obviously a film is, is just one chunk. And, and you're and Emma, do you, do you feel as film producers that you would easily be able to move between film and television or do you feel that you um, uh, have had to specialise? I think, um, this is, again, specifically because this is going to younger people joining into the film industry, I think you have to be really flexible and be prepared to do everything because the way that the screen industries is going, um, there's a lot of fluidity. And um, so for me personally, I came in wanting to be a film producer, having a film slate, but I've also got a TV slate. I've also got other content that isn't film or TV that's different length that could work with other types of platforms and I think that's just the way you have to really look at things these days as a producer um, so yeah like that that's the way I look at things anyway. Would Emma I, do you feel the same? I would echo that I think historically they have there's been a bit more of a wall between them but as audiences have started to blend their desires for different formats and as the talent have sort of followed that so you now have like Lenny Abramson or Steve McQueen doing high-end TV in an incredibly cinematic way. They want to bring their collaborators with them or you have people who've worked in TV coming into film a lot more. So I think that's blended it and I think that's all for the good, to be honest, um, because it gives more opportunities to people. I certainly think if you're starting your career out now, coming at it with that mindset from the beginning is probably really healthy. I think it's also really sorry Ron I was just going to say I do think it's it's important to talk about that as it relates to how you kind of survive in film producing because I think one of the things that I could never work out is like how is everyone surviving financially I mean it's really difficult to <laughs> uh, spread out those development budgets and and make it a kind of proper wage and you have to you get paid generally you're kind of like a, main portion of your fee on the first day of principal photography so it is really hard to balance that work and it's and if you're doing script work like it's it's a lot of work I think and so um one of my I, I actually never did any tv uh as a producer but I used to get offered quite a lot of kind of I think there was it felt like at the time I'd made war book anyway there was so much more work in television like there was there, there were actually companies sort of almost like saying we've got so many hours do you want we're also look we're trying to widen our producer pool um and so i kind of did a couple of those meetings and they were quite long engagements so i kind of never managed to make it work but i think actually that it's it i found a way to make it work with maybe commercials or music videos or something that would kind of be or a little bit of script editing on the side that would be a way to make a living as you're trying to get the films up and running but i think it's it's actually uh, all experience is probably good experience, yeah. especially like a paid job where you know where you can work at, at a fast pace and and you have build all those relationships. And um, I think this is a really important point, and something I was going to come on to is 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 money and how you make a living as a producer. Um, so I guess a, a question, sort of two part question, is um, uh, do do producers tend to work as independent, you know, or as freelancers, or do they tend to work for production companies? And who pays the producer? That's so, really Emma. Let's start with you. Let's start with you. If I think there's a real mixture. So there are people who sort of will start in often in development at a larger or medium sized production company. And then that's a really interesting route in because when you have a salary, you're learning from people who are more experienced and then that's all in house, but you probably have less freedom because it's not your company. You're not having creative control over the slate in the same way, although you may influence it. And then independent producers, that's your own company. So you're responsible for bringing any investment in, bringing all the development funding in, production, finance. So you are paying yourself then. So those are sort of two models. There are also independent producers who might get brought onto a project with somebody else. Like Lauren was talking about at the beginning that quite often it is a jigsaw puzzle of, bringing different people's skills in to make the right mix for the film. And then in that case, it might be a sort of combination of, the, of, of that picture, I suppose. 
Um, so I want to ask each of you what what your typical day looks like, uh, what what you're doing in any in any particular day. I was just can I just oh, add on that yes. though that if you're an independent producer, your company for a while might not pay yourself, and you will be doing other things, and that is totally fine. And I think we need to not normalise that to the point that we're expecting people to not be paid that's not what I'm saying but normalize the fact that like most producers who you see once they have their films out had a like side hustle for a long time and like Lauren said that might be doing commercials it might be actually that you have a salaried position in development for somebody else it might be that you've been assisting a producer um whatever that might may be that experience that you get I, I think the more you can get from that as well as having it as an income source it's really brilliant and that ultimately is what's going to make your trajectory unique as a producer and and bring other skills and a perspective um uh, and like Lauren was saying that's what makes this industry really interesting and collaborations really interesting is that particularly for producers there's no set route um so you've really just got like a really a wealth of talent so I would for younger people starting out um whatever path you take is totally fine and is going to make you have a unique perspective and set of skills great um and i think i think just on that point it's also it's really important to sort of demystify or sort of um be very clear about and um, the fact that you you do not have to be independently wealthy to be to be a producer um you know you may have to take on other uh, other work as, as you say to um to sort of pay yourself at the beginning um but um it's it's not just a um uh, a, a rich man's game um Okay, so uh, before we, I think it would be great in a minute to sort of really dig into what those sort of roots into the industry are and perhaps, you know, where each of you started and also, you know, what skills and sort of personal qualities make a good producer. But before we do that, um, I'd just love to ask each of you what a typical, like what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so um, Emma, I'm going to start with you and, um, you know, by all means, you can talk a little bit about the, the day job that you have now, but also, you know, what, what a day-to-day -day job looks like as a, as a producer. Um, so a caveat that I've been I'm doing maternity cover at BBC Films as head of development I've been in the job about two weeks so I still haven't quite established a, a regular day-to-day -day, but certainly on that side in development in term in that's more exec capacity it's an awful lot of reading having conversations with producers writers directors watching an awful lot of stuff whether that is people's work that we want to work with and sort of seeing what's out there or watching cuts of films that are in post or rushes of stuff that's in production and then when I was a when I was producing Mari I was working part-time so I was sort of squashing it in around things but it really really varied it was an awful lot of awful lot of phone calls an awful lot of sitting in front of the laptop not very glamorous or exciting at all um and that role's quite reactive actually so it was you know something comes up and that's really pressing like you think someone is actually uh, interested say in putting the finance to close the film then that becomes your priority in, in terms of meeting them so it's really varied but lots of meetings lots of um digging into that script with the director um and yeah a lot of a lot of laptops <laughs> lots of not <laughs> um very glamorous stuff that is actually is that... very very solo i think that that's a really beautiful thing about if you have an opportunity to collaborate with another producer is that that can be really good for morale because i think it can be quite a quite a lonely job in certain points of it which is strange because I think it's an it's a occupation that attracts rightly a lot of very collaborative people so you that's really fulfilling but there are moments where it will just be you sort of up against it um sorting the problems out <laughs> your does that um does that all sound familiar does that is that is that how you spend your day pretty much I think it's a lot on the phone a lot on the laptop lots of meetings lots of dealing with all sorts of different people whether it's 
if your execs, you're speaking to them about things in development, you're thinking about, you're speaking to them about things if you're in production at the same time, you're, you're on the phone with all the different types of um, filmmaker you're collaborating with. There's some people that might have quite a small slate and they might just be working with one other person or two other people, but I've got quite a varied slate. So I'm constantly talking to lots of different people about that. And, um, but then aside from that, um, I'm running a company. So I'm not an independent producer that goes from film to film to film. I'm building a company. So there's also just things to do with managing a company and people and infrastructure and boring admin type stuff. So it, there's a myriad of things in every day. And COVID-19 has just upended everything as well. So, um, and I've got two very young kids. So given it's given COVID, I'm trying to do, to balance a lot more of spending time with them and doing work. So my, my day is very truncated as a consequence. Um, and just uh, the last final thing is a lot of reading of material, lots of different types of material, not just scripts, um, pilots for TV, um, bits of literature that could turn into films, articles, essays, um, and then lots of watching of all types of media because it's amazing how you can be inspired. And one thing to remember um, to everyone listening is as a producer, you really are creative. Even if you're, I've, I come from a finance background and, um, and they are, um, as Emma alluded to, there's lots of different types of producer, people that might be more financy, more logistical, more creative. Um, but I think you have to really embrace that creative side of things, regardless of your role. And you're so key to instigating a project um, with your ideas. So the more you can immerse yourself with lots of different types of media, the better. So I, I do that a lot in my day as well. Lauren, what does your typical day look like? Is there a typical day? No, not really. But we do we do start the week off with a kind of all team meet where everybody update. We have a kind of list of front runners, and we we we're always looking at this year's slate and then next year's slate. So people will update on financing, press, production, creative, and then we'll have a just creative team meet where we look at submissions and meetings we've had in the week. Um, and then my colleague Julia and I try to have a call list of kind of, we kind of do general meets with UK and US agents and producers. Um, we'll take meetings on some submissions, take pitches, uh, talk to producers a lot. If we've got things in production, we're watching rushes or we're doing daily calls. Um, and I've never cracked between BFI or Film 4 the reading pile. So usually what still happens is I put my three-year-old to bed and then I read a script for the next day, which happens kind of pretty much a week. And then we, but we kind of try to take Fridays off for reading. And I managed to get about two and a half read. <laughs> but that, yeah, the reading part is, it, it just, the days are so back to back and they're so packed with meetings that actually there's never, and even that kind of change of pace to sitting in a quiet corner is just quite a clump. So um, that's, that's probably like a snapshot of the week. So, we, so even though yours is a sort of um, uh, perhaps a more traditionally office-based job than, than, than the producer, it's still not, not a nine to five as such, is it? No, n not really for, for that main reason. And I think you can't, you sort of, we're sort of also try, trying to work on the producer's time frame. So if, if someone needs to call the night before a shoot, then that's, you know, that, that's what happens. So we're kind of like, I'd say fairly available. And then, and then I guess the flexi time bit of it is also like I've got a young kid. So. Um, I'll try and stop for a bit during the kind of tea bed bath and then start again when he's asleep and, and that is kind of quite quiet time in the, in the day to read. Um, Di, t tell us about uh, your, your typical day. Uh, well, as I was saying earlier, you know, I start the day at set um, and end the day at set and then in between I'm uh, planning ahead. I'm uh, perhaps booking additional crew or new crew that might be coming on later. I'm booking equipment. I have meetings with HODs about their budgets. I meet with the accountant. Um, cost reporting is always a, um, a one just to see where we are. So as we're, the difficulty is to always be on top of where you are with the budget because 
I could go to set and somebody says to me, oh, we'd really like a camera crane for that. And you, you need to know whether you've got the money to do it. Um, and because if not, you need to have a negotiation and, and the conversation there and then. So keeping on top of all of that is, is a big part. Um, and sometimes I get called back to set anyway because there's a problem, there's some equipment that's broken down, which is going to delay everything. Um, and it's hard to know what I do, <laughs> really. But it is, it's a constant planning and booking things and having meetings, because if there's other episodes shooting, then I'm meeting with directors and first ADs and looking at schedules and, and so on. And what do you what what sort of uh, skills or um, personal qualities do you think is essential to be to be a good line producer? I mean, it sounds there's an like there's an awful lot of sort of financial planning, budgeting, a lot of negotiation. Lot of negotiation. So yes, negotiating is definitely one, and communication. Um, and I think people management. I I see that as one of. I see that as the most important part of my job, really, because it all it all feeds into to keeping the budget running. Really, um, I think it's I think it's important to build relationships and take the time to build relationships with with people on set and people that are looking after their own pockets of finance. Um, so I spend a lot of time doing that. And even just sort of chatting to the camera team, you know, how was your, how was your grandfather's birthday party at the weekend or whatever? Because I think that then makes them feel that if there's a problem, they can come to me, which means I can stop, as I said before, potentially stop it before it becomes a big issue. And how, how does one get to be a line producer? Do you need to have, um, you know, accounting qualifications or anything like that? No, uh, if I'm honest, I have absolutely no paper qualifications at all. I went to drama school and did stage management. I spent six years in theatre. And then I, uh, I went into the BBC drama department and sort of worked my way that way. I think... What you do need to do is you need an understanding of how production works um, because obviously you are talking to suppliers of equipment. So you've got to know what you're talking about from that point of view. You've also got to have a bit of an understanding of the script because if a director is wanting something in particular, you have to understand where he's coming from and, and how important it is to the script that that happens or whether you know you can suggest another way around it um but i think uh sorry i've lost track of where i was going there um yeah so in in terms of skills that they're, they're i think the trick is not to try and move too quickly if you start somewhere um you, you know, I see a lot of people in, in TV who have um, who kind of shot up to where they are. But when a crisis hits, they, they haven't got the experience from seeing someone else deal with something similar to be able to deal with, with a crisis. So I think it is important not to, not to try and go too fast. Great. And, and you're Lauren and um, Emma, I'll slightly throw this a similar question open to you in terms of, um, you know, what, may, what personal qualities or skills does one need to have to be, to be an effective producer? Who's going to go first? I'll Emma, I'm going to pick, oh no, I'll you're, go you're, go on. I think just building on what Di said about relationships, someone that can really build relationships they're so important I think talent is so important in making a film and you get very talented people on board projects but how you interact with them and communicate with them is just so important and I think that if there's one thing that you can have um, in order to make things run smoothly and to get the best results um, it's always to just build relationships and put a lot of 
put a lot of time into that. If you're a young person joining into the industry, how you can do that is just by building a network, by going to lots of events, by joining what we are doing today, um, finding those different people that can, um, can be in your network and grow your network. Um, and that, you just start building that skill of forming relationships and using um, using other people's talents um, within your crew and within that network um, for your projects. So that would be one thing I would say. And is it in, it, does one, do you need to have a, um, a qualification? Do you need to, I mean, I, you, you can study producing, say, at the National Film and Television School. Is that, is that necessary? I don't, well, I've got loads of, um, friends in the industry that went to film school but loads that didn't I didn't go to film school I studied economics and finance at uni I went into I, like I've got finance background but I always wanted to make films on the side I made short films I made music videos I did things in the art world and I alongside all of that I always had this ambition of being of making films um, and so it just got to a point where I had built enough of a reputation, I'd made a, a good enough relationships and enough trust um, to then be able to then build my slate and then start actually being a producer. So I think there's lots of ways in. I don't think you necessarily have to have qualifications, though they really can help. And they really can help with, um, with the network thing I'm talking about. Everyone that goes to film school goes with other people. And there's a built-in network already when you start within film. So, so there's, yeah, there's, there's loads of ways in basically. And, and Lauren and Emma, if, um, if you're not going down the, uh, the, the film school route and you want to start out, um, uh, you know, what, what might be a good entry point sort of straight out of, straight out of university? What kinds of jobs might someone be, um, be, be looking, should be looking for? I kind of think everyone should be a runner for a bit. What it allows you is you get you get put into every single department, just thrown wherever anyone needs you. And I think it gives you a real sense, particularly if you want to be a producer, about what everyone's kind of tension point is, what the needs, are, what the conflicting needs are of all of those different departments. I think it's extremely useful. Um, and, and that's just probably, I think what I did was just wrote to everybody, like in my last year of university. Uh, Film schools, I think, expensive unless you can get a scholarship. So if so, it, I'm sure it's useful and it gives you a set of connections and relationships and teaches you a lot. And you get, of course, the most important thing to practice making films. Um, and that's that. These things are difficult to do on your own. So I think um, it, it's useful for some people. But but of course, you can try to just get experience in any way that you can. Shadow people, work as a runner, um, make some shorts if you can, or work on other people's shorts. Um, all experience, I think, is useful. Everyone's is so different. Emma, I think earlier you were talking about a slightly different route of being an like a producer's assistant or um, or working sort of in house or in development uh, or in development development development. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that sorry, a delay or an echo. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think there's so many ways in, particularly for producing, because as I was saying before, as a producer, you are across every single relationship involved in making that film. So any experience at any of those points is going to help you learn something about producing. So whether you're a runner in a post house or you're a assistant for a talent agent or a literary agency, or you work for a producer or you're a trainee on set in one of the many different departments like all of that is really really great experience because you will learn so much about those areas I also think that more broadly things like working at festivals you will learn a huge amount a lot of festivals have labs and I learn uh, I had my first job in film working at film London helping them run international labs um, and it was great for me because it was a job, so I was getting paid, but I was also getting to sit in the back of those labs and listen to everything and absorb it like a sponge. So I think it's just absorbing everything you can find and then following your nose a little bit. Like I didn't have that slightly more traditional route of either film school or being a runner or being a producer's assistant. Um, I came to it a bit later, but because I had good experience elsewhere I sort of were like just had to get a job out of university to pay the rent and ended up 
becoming quite experienced at like project man project management and managing events and so that made me quite valuable to organizations that were working in film in different ways so i think really like know what your strengths are um and just insert yourself somewhere like just keep keep pushing and don't take no for an answer <laughs> And on this, on this question of knowing what your strengths are, um, how important is it as a producer to be, to be good at everything? You know, some producers are maybe stronger on finance, some producers are maybe uh, better on creative. Do you have to be good at everything? No. And I, th I think it's better to know what you're not good at than to try and be good at everything. Um, I, um... I when I first started line producing, I worked with a, a, a producer, a very experienced, very good producer, who said to me, um, always employ people who are better at their jobs than you are. And that thing, you know, you can't do it all. You just have to, it's, it's that old thing of having a dog and barking yourself, really. You, you, you get someone who is really good at what they do, and then you slightly then don't have to worry about that. You can just keep an eye and learn from them. Mm. Um, and then just before we um we go to um uh, questions from from the audience of which of which we've got lo oh my goodness we've got loads <laughs> um just um i want to quickly um uh, ask about how important it is to think about your uh, brand as a producer you know the kinds of you know particularly uh, your maybe if you're you know building your own company um thinking about you know the kind of work you want to make what do you stand for the kinds of directors you work with C can you afford to be that sort of strategic strategic at the beginning or is that something that comes comes later I think you have to be strategic I think I for me personally I think different people do things in different ways but I've always been very uh, definite about the types of films I want to make um, and my company's called dark pictures I'm really interested in the dark side of human nature and that's reflected in my choices in terms of what types of scripts I go for, what types of other material I go for. I like um, like bold, uncompromising statements about the human condition. I'm currently being mentored by Steve McQueen. And whenever we have chats, it's always really about, it is about that. It's about what do you really stand for as a filmmaker and um, producers are filmmakers as well. And, um, and yeah, and that, I think that just seeps into everything that I do and how I look at things in terms of my company. So yeah, I think personal branding and the branding of your company is important. Great. Okay, so let's dig into this pile of questions. Um, so um, Amy Hayward's got a question. I think this is really important. She wants to know how important it is to be based in London uh, if you want to start a, a career as a producer. <laughs> Is, is that important? Can you also be, um, you know, be working on, uh, on, on this and becoming a producer if you're not based in London? I would say so, yes. I mean, there's so much, there's so much work that's done um, in the regions now. Um, you know, I, I live in Wales. I, I mean, I do work in London sometimes. I, but I haven't actually done a job in London, a proper job in London for a lot of years. I work in Cardiff, I've worked in Bristol, I've worked in Manchester. There's so much regional work, I don't, I don't think it matters where you live. Great. I think that's a really, that's really key, isn't it? I mean, there can, there's always an assumption that you have to be based in London for these, for these jobs. But, um, you know, the BFI has um, a really great uh, BFI network, network of execs around, around the country that can help to support producers and directors um, working, working around the country. Um, okay, so question from Maddie. What would you say it takes for someone to go from a good producer to a really great producer? What's that little extra something that makes you great? Die. Let's, let's hear <laughs> you. Go on. <laughs> um, I would say I've worked with many first time producers and there are some that are, I have to put this tactfully, who will be, you know, I've, I've been doing, I've been line producing for a hundred years. So um, I've worked with new producers who will 
let me help and 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 I've worked with other new producers who become very dogmatic because they don't because they don't know they become dogmatic rather than allowing someone with experience to help them you know it's not showing a weakness or anything like that so I think it's important for a producer to um, listen and be open to other people's input. Great, thank you. Um, question from Adiola. Um, as a recent graduate, what is the best way to find collaborators, uh, collaborators and like-minded people, particularly for small scale projects? I would say sign up to absolutely everything. Sign up to every mailing list from all the institutions, join shooting people, join like absolutely anything you can where they're going to be other people in your ecosystem. Um, the thing is with the mailing lists for BFI, um, Film London, Creative England, all those sorts of bodies, they, they always give you more information about what's going on in the, in the industry, where there are drinks, where there are other people doing stuff, what initiatives they are that you can apply to. So I'll just sign up to absolutely everything and, and do that. And yeah. And just to follow on from that, a question from Toby. You mentioned um, uh, your, your mentor, um, uh, Steve McQueen, earlier. How important is it to have a mentor? I think it's really important. I think um, I was fortunate enough to be on a scheme, well, an initiative for producers um, that are sort of getting along in their career. And, um, and so it's, it's been interesting to have him as a mentor. But I, I think you should always look for mentors at whatever stage you are in life, whatever industry you work in. I think leaning on people with experience to just to find out more about them the world yourself is really important but then also you can be a mentor the good thing about this this particular initiative is i'm mentored by someone like him but then i also mentee someone that is starting out in the industry and it's been just as rewarding being able to listen to what they're up to read all their stuff give input be a sounding board i think mentoring is just a, a it's a really important thing going through and you'll continue to do it throughout your career, not only receive uh, mentoring, but then also be a mentor yourself. Great. So question from Laura Gaynor. Hi, Laura. Um, if you were all at your early, uh, early career stage again, was, is there anything you would do differently? Lauren, let's, um, let's direct that at you. Anything I'd do differently? I don't, I thought it's a tricky question because I've, feel like I probably at the time I didn't particularly want to be making commercials like I didn't really want I, I felt like a lot of time where I couldn't get things going and I didn't know how to make those connections and it felt like it took a really long time but actually there was a point I think when I started making Warbook which was a real micro budget film and I, I mean we, I don't it, we, it was such a small crew and I just thought I just wouldn't have been able to do that film in any way if I hadn't learned production so it was like it's, it was all in in the end it's all valuable isn't it so i don't know if there's anything actually that i would have done differently um emma i'm going to direct this question to you um from kimberly as a producer um would you work on a project that wasn't of interest to you personally probably not but that's not to say that there wouldn't be a reason for a producer who wasn't interested in the material to do it like I think the reasons for people joining projects are really diverse um I think a lot of independent producers want to be really motivated by what it is that you're making but it might be that it offers you something else like another string to your bow or in to have in your arsenal like maybe it's like an international co-production that's going to introduce you to um a director who you want to work with for your next project or it might just it might give you some experience that is really valuable to you um but generally speaking no i think that would be because the life of a film is so long i think really it needs to be giving you something throughout that process or it, it, making films is hard so i think you want to have that that motivation coming from a 
quite a genuine place. Mm. It takes up so much of your life as well that, <laughs> you know, to be committed to something that you're not really interested in when you have to give so much of your life to it. I think it would be very yeah. difficult. Mm. Um, I've got quite a few questions for you, Di, all mm. roughly um, <laughs> variations on um, uh, dealing with relationships on set. Um, mm. How do you maintain, you know, as a dream killer, how do you maintain positive relationships with your director? And also, have you ever had to deal with conflict amongst crew on set? How do you deal with that effectively? Uh, well, the director one, first of all, as I say, um, during the prep period, which is, uh, I don't know, maybe eight weeks or something, um, I work very hard to, for the director to, to trust me and, and, you know, yes, it is all about the money, but there are often ways around it um, and there's horse trading to be done. So, um, and I... The, the other thing I tried to do, when we go on the technical recce, uh, which is when we look at all the locations with the HODs and the director hopefully talks about how they want to shoot it, and then you start to get a, a list of additional equipment that you might just be bringing in for odd days. Um, I often ask the director and the director of photography if they can give me a bit of an idea ahead of that for their list. Uh, so as I can cost it up. But what I do do is when they say I want a crane here or three cameras here, I I try not there and then to say no. I try and say, let me look at it and let me get your whole list together and we'll look at it and I will probably come back to you and say, you can have two of those if you drop that. Or So I, I try and do it in, in that way. I think the to not give an outright no, I think that's that's a very tricky. That tends to inflame a situation if you do that. And how about dealing with conflict? Yes, well, there's quite a lot of that. Quite often, um, if it's uh, if it's between two crew members, I I just have to talk to them about it. it. It will usually come about because somebody has come to me and said so and so's such and such. So um, I would sort of talk to each of them and get, because there's two sides to every story. And then um, if I have to, just sit them down together and, and sort of try and get them to talk it out. Great. Um, at what, so a question from Hattie. At what stage does a project need to be to get onto a producer's slate? So um, perhaps Emma and Yor will um, will hear, hear from hear from you on that. At, at what stage do you come on board a project? Can I go, Emma, or do you want me to? Emma, go okay. on. Oh, um, I, it can really vary. It really doesn't doesn't. I mean, it does matter to the project, but there isn't like a set bar that you'd have to get over. It could be as simple as like a magazine article or something that's the kernel of an idea um or it can be you know there's a draft that already exists i think in terms of approaching a producer i think it's more about that relationship so a director or writer that you're already working with comes to you with a little something you want to be on that from the beginning and supporting them and helping feed into that um whereas if it's somebody who you don't know so well you're probably also trying to get to know them alongside um influencing it because i think producers need to have a lot of responsibility as well in terms of the feedback that we give and and making sure that that's actually right for the project um so you wouldn't want to be diving straight into something before you'd really built up that trust and no understanding really what that writer or that writer director's sort of vision was for it so um i think yeah anyway that i think it really varies the short answer 
and just to say that um, uh, the, the next month's lab is going to really dig into the relationship between producer and director and how you build those positive relationships, how you, how you find each other, how you find your collaborators. So we're not going to dig into that today um but do do absolutely um come back come back next month for for that um i think we're we're almost out of time but i'd love to end by asking each of you um you know if you have uh, what what advice would you give to someone at this stage who is maybe maybe still at school um uh and is thinking that they might want to be a producer what can they be doing practically at this stage um to uh, to, to to give them a leg up to to, to get started um, Lauren, let's start with you. I think if I didn't really have any connections when I was at university and I also knew that I wouldn't be able to afford to kind of move to London and then try and build up internships. So I was doing bits and bobs at university and I think I just used all of the websites like Mandy and shooting people um, and just wrote to any short film crew crewing up and it got and it was on any set I could get on, I think, for a couple of years. And then that just turned into... I think from really early on in the start, I think one person on that shoot would be going on to this film and they would give my name as a recommendation. And, and I think it just built up like that. So I would say my advice would be as any and all experience that you can get. Brilliant, thanks. Your, any, any advice you, can, you want to share? I would say what Lauren said is really important just about experience and trying to get it. Um, so I would say probably read a lot about story that would be the other thing that i'd uh, say if you um, emma said before about how to identify what projects you want to do um i think you also really need to understand scripts why they work how they work because that that document is the most important thing like you have a you have great um directors and actors and crew that all come on board and turn it into this fantastic film but it will not be a fantastic film if the screenplay isn't amazing. And if you as a producer don't really understand why that document is going to be amazing, you're not really going to be able to do your job that well. So just read about scripts and read lots of them is what I would say. Brilliant. Emma? Um, I think I would just echo that. And what I might just add is this, I think you do want to get as much experience as possible. But also, I think there's this idea sometimes, if I look back on when I was younger, of moving very quickly and feeling like I want to get here and why aren't I there yet? And there's no, there's no such thing as a, a perfect producer. Um, and I think making sure that you're able to sort of define success on your own terms and that you, you take the time. Oh, I think I'm dropping out. I can hear you. Oh, cool. I think something just froze, it wasn't me. Um, defining success on your own terms and making sure that you look around you, like we were talking about mentoring before, but look at your peers, like long term, they are gonna be the strongest, most influential relationships of your career. Um, so really finding your people, and even if you're not there yet, you'll zoom ahead in five years time and you'll all be there together. Um, that's really great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Di, any anything that you that, that you would want to um, uh, get advice that you would want to pass on? Uh, I would say try and get as much uh, experience, uh, be it work experience or on a, a set, so that you understand. Because when it comes to script, if you don't understand how a set works and what's possible and what might not be possible and why that is um then you so yes i would say get as much experience as you can if you've got a mate who's who's working on something see if you can sort of spend a couple of days work experience and i, I would agree with emma don't do it in your own time don't don't compare yourself with the speed other people are moving if i did that i think i would have given up because everybody kind of went like like that we all go at a different pace and um, yeah take your time enjoy it exactly. there because that's what's like i was saying for that's what's going to like give you your perspective on things so you want to be paying attention and enjoying it because it's hard work yeah. um 
So it is. You, you know, enjoy the payoff. Yeah. That's such a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy it, everyone. Um, and just to say, I know we, we had about 180 questions during this, and I'm so sorry, I only just managed to scratch the surface. Um, but I hope, um, I hope you still got, um, got lots of great information uh, out of this session. Um, so thanks so much to Lauren, Di, Yor and Emma for giving up this time on your Saturday um, and for sharing your insight and wisdom. Um, and I hope um, you'll all leave um inspired and will uh you know be knocking on lauren's door in five years time looking for money um as um the next generation of uh of uk producers um alex i'm going to pass back to you thanks so much thanks, Thank you. Thank you so much, Rowan. Thank you, all the panelists. You've been amazing. Your tips have been really great. The chat has been popping and I think uh, everyone has been really, really um, grateful and learned a lot today. Um, thank you everyone watching for all your questions. As Rowan said, this has been a record number of questions for our labs. So choosing that lacy winner um, has been really, really, really tough. Um, but um, before I get onto that, I just wanted to um, say that you will be um, sent a link from Eventbrite um, to a survey and Noel will also shortly post it in the chat box as well. It would be great if you could let us know what you thought of today's session, um, if you thought we've improved uh, since we started this series of digital labs, if there is anything else you would like to see implemented, your feedback is really invaluable. So if you have a few minutes, it would be great um, if you could fill that survey in. Um, and as Rowan said, um, the next lab uh, will be all about the creative collaboration between the producer and the director. It will take place on the 5th of September. It's a Saturday as well at 12.30 p.m. Um, the full title is Upskilling in Isolation, How to Make the Producer and Director Collaboration a Success. Um, so we'll follow on from this discussion to talk about uh, what, uh, which talked about what a producer is, to talk about how directors can find uh, the perfect producing collaborators for their projects, um, how um, they, um, how a producer and director work together to share um, the same creative vision, uh, to align on the creative vision, how to communicate effectively, how to approach any problems and any creative tension. So do uh, make sure to tune in. Um, the registrations for that lab will open on Monday the 24th of um, August and we'll post about it across all our social channels but if you want to um, just like always we've created a Facebook group so like not a Facebook group a Facebook event and if you click on going or interested then you'll be the first to know we'll post in there as soon as our registrations open um, and now on to the uh, Lacey winner so I will um, call your name out and um, Noah will uh, post the name in the chat box as well. Um, so if you hear your name called, please type here in the chat box and I'll give you a few seconds um, to respond. And then if I don't hear from you, if you've left the session, I'll move on um, to the next name. So be uh, ready at your keyboards. Um, so uh, the winner of our Lacey um, rugged two terabyte hard drive um, in the August lab is Kimberly Johnson. Kimberly, are you here? Amazing. Congratulations, Kimberly. Um, I will be in touch with you um, next week about mailing your prize. Um, everyone else, thank you so much uh, for attending um, today's lab. Thank you so much for all your insightful questions. Um, if you missed any of the information that was discussed today or you just um, want to watch it again, we'll post the recording of this lab um, on our YouTube um, channel next week, but we'll um, tweet about it and we'll um, share the link across all our social channels. So make sure you're following us. Thank you again, Rowan. Thank you, our panelists. And thanks, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Bye.